this morning's tour portion is called Imor. Everyone say Imor. Imor means speak. It's one of the most used words in the Torah. And we're going to learn how God speaks to us and why he speaks to us. And it's your Torah portion. And you're going to learn beautiful things about how it's all about holiness. God is speaking to us through his word. And we know with the revelation of Yeshua that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and gave us even, even greater understanding of the written Torah. In this week's Torah portion, it covers the holiness of the priests and why Yeshua has to have a bride without spot or blemish. Because Torah says that a priest can only marry a virgin. And it's going to talk about the holy days. And it's going to talk about the holy place. In the Mikdash, the tabernacle, the holy place had the menorah and the table of showbread and the altar of incense. So all of these things from chapter 21 through 24 in Leviticus is with a focus of different aspects of holiness that he's speaking to us so that we can be a kingdom of priests. It's no longer just the Levites who are intended to be priests, but all of God's people who will be renewed and sanctified just as his original covenant with Israel was to have priests from every tribe. And this is what Yeshua has renewed so that we can be a kingdom of priests. This is why he says, know ye not that you will be priests. And it, sometimes it's translated as priests and kings with me in the kingdom, speaking of the millennium, but it's actually supposed to be translated a kingdom of priests. He's the king and he's the high priest and we will reign as holy priests underneath him. And if you look at this word imor in the Hebrew, you have an aleph and you have a mem and you have a resh. The aleph is the first letter of Elohim. The Mem, you could look at as the word for Messiah, or you could look at it as Maim is waters. And in prophecy, waters always represent peoples, nations, and tongues. So Elohim is speaking to the people through his word. And this Resh is the word for Rosh, which is the head. It's like the ultimate uh, prince. It's the word for prince or for the head, which is Yeshua. So whether you look at the Mem as being Messiah or the Resh being Messiah, we know that he's reaching his head people through Messiah, his word. And this is how he speaks to us. You can find it in your Bibles in Vayikra or Leviticus chapter 21. We'll start in verse 1, and we go through chapter 24. Four chapters, which in the midst of, is one of the most beautiful chapters on the holy days. And we're going to look at the symbolism, and we'll take most of the time this morning looking at the symbolism of the holy days, and how they are prophetic foreshadowings of everything that Yeshua would fulfill as the suffering servant, and as the prophet like unto Moshe, and as the high priest, and as the king. Chapter 21 and 22 covers the laws for the priest to know how to be holy as an example for the people. Chapter 23 is the laws on how to keep his holy days, which starts with the weekly Shabbat and then goes into the annual holy days. And chapter 24 is about the holiness of maintaining the holy place, how the priests were supposed to press the oil for the menorah, prepare the unleavened bread, 12 of them, one for each tribe representing Israel, because Yeshua is not the only one who's to be a living Torah. This shows us that each one of us from each one of the tribes is to be a living Torah. Yeshua is just our example. He came to show us the way. So the fact that it's unleavened bread and that there's 12 of them shows that we too are to be unleavened with sin. So the very first verse says, Vai Omer, here you can see that, Emor, the root word right here, Vai Omer Adonai El Moshe, Emer, again. So you see it two places, and spoke Adonai El Moshe to Moshe, saying Omer there, see it in two different places? El Hakonim, the priest, B'nai Aharon, the sons of Aaron. This is who you're supposed to tell this instruction to. So because the rest of the tribes had lost the privilege of being priests because they bowed the knee to the golden calf, God said for the time being, the only tribe that didn't bend the knee to the idol worship of the golden calf would become the priest in their place. So the Levites just happened to have the same amount, 22,000 from uh, one month old to uh, 
two, one month old and older basically was the same number of the firstborn that were intended to be priests from all of the other tribes. 22,000 basically lost that privilege by bowing the knee to idol worship. And so here we can see this root word Omer in two different places. And the whole focus of this beautiful portion is about holiness and the beauty of holiness. 1 Peter 1.15 says, But now you must be holy. So the New Testament isn't promoting, like many Christians say, that Yeshua came to be the Holy One and to be an overcomer so that we can continue to sin and be unholy. We are called to holiness. He's our example. But now you must be holy in everything you do. How much? Just in what we say or just in what we do? Or how about even what we think, the source of everything? In everything. Just as God, who chose you to be his children, is holy. For he himself has said, and then Peter quotes the Torah in saying, You must be holy because I am holy. That's from Leviticus. Ephesians 1.4, Paul says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So this first two chapters are going to talk about the laws of holiness for the priest as an example. Chapter 21 says, Adonai said to Moshe, Speak to the Kohanim, the priests, the sons of Aharon, saying to them, No Kohen is to make himself unclean for any of his people who dies. So when you're a set-apart person, even death or being in close association with death was a way of making yourself unclean because God is only the source of life. There's no death in Him. He's light and there's no darkness in Him. He's only love and there's no mixture. So what He's teaching through the priest is don't let there be any mixture of life and death, light and darkness. Be an example. Except for, because of the compassion of the Lord, he understands that those that are closest to us, like our immediate family, if you need to bury a husband or a wife or a father or a mother or a child, this was an exception because God is always showing that the heart, it's an issue of the heart as far as compassion. He may also make himself unclean for his virgin sister who is never married and therefore dependent on him. So his sister, until she's married, is basically underneath his covering if, she, if her father has passed on. He may not make himself unclean because he is a leader among his people. Doing so would profane him. Kohanim are not to make bald spots on their heads or mar the edges of their beard or cut gashes or mark their flesh. Why? Because this was a practice that was done by the pagans that would commemorate the dead. Once again, we have the hope of the resurrection. We're not supposed to mourn the dead as if we don't have any hope. And this is what they would do is make permanent marks in their hair or in their bodies, remembering their dead ones. And so even tattooing began with commemorating the dead or, uh, you know, that bowl haircut that you, sometimes you see, they would cut off their beard or they would shave their head. A lot of women in India to this day will shave their head when their husbands uh, die. It's a sign of mourning. He's telling the priest, don't do these things. Rather, they are to be holy for their God and not profane the name of their God. So now he's bringing up the name, the Holy One, the yod heh vav -Heh. For they are the ones who present yod heh vav -Heh with offerings made by fire, the bread of their God. Therefore, they must be holy. And now we see some beautiful symbolism of our high priest. As he's going to fulfill Torah, you will understand now why he's calling us to be holy as his bride. Because a Kohen, a priest, cannot marry either an adulterous woman or a prostitute or anyone who is not completely pure. Here in verse 7 it says, A Kohen is not to marry a woman who is a prostitute, who has been profaned, or who has been divorced, because he is holy for his God. Rather, he's speaking now to the assembly, you are to set him apart as holy. So there's a responsibility for the assembly to make sure that their leader maintains this high level of holiness because he's an intercessor on their behalf. And then he has a responsibility to intercede and hold them accountable. It says, because he offers the bread, uh, symbolizing or speaking of the showbread of your God, he is to be holy for you. So this priest was an intercessor, and it's for you. And since it's for you, you hold him accountable. Make sure that he doesn't do these things. Because I am Adonai who makes you holy, and I am holy. 
The daughter of a priest who profanes herself by prostitution or adultery profanes her father. She is to be put to death by fire. This is why, remember when Jacob found out that Tamar was pregnant, even though he was the one that impregnated her, he didn't know it, what did he do? He was going to go follow Torah and have her burned as someone who had profaned this. Why? Because she's the daughter of a priest. Many people don't realize that Tamar was the granddaughter of Melchizedek, the high priest. And when Melchizedek died, his son Eber became the high priest. So this, when, you, when the scriptures speak of Yeshua being of the order of Melchizedek, it's referring to his lineage through Judah and Tamar. He's literally physically of that lineage. And this is why they had to follow this commandment. This is in Genesis 38, verse 24. He says, The Kohen who is ranked highest, this would be the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest among his brothers, the one on whose head is the anointing oil is poured, and who is consecrated to put on the holy garments, is not to stop grooming his hair, or he's not supposed to tear his clothes. Go in to where any dead body is, or make himself unclean, even where his father and mother dies. So now there's even a higher calling for the high priest. He may not leave the sanctuary then, or profane the sanctuary of his God, because the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is on him. I am yod heh vav -Heh. He is to marry a virgin. He may not marry a widow, or a divorcee, or an adulteress, profaned woman, or a prostitute. He must marry a virgin from among his own people. This is another reason why Israel is the bride. When you look at the symbolism of Yeshua being our high priest, and everyone, Paul says, can be grafted into Israel, but there's no separate bride. There's no separate woman that says, oh, I want access to God apart from being married to Yeshua. This is what's called a harlot in Revelation, where certain churches will say, that's nice that Israel was chosen in the past, but we replaced Israel. This is called replacement theology. This is a hidden form of harlotry. God intends for us to be grafted into the bride who is from his own people. And there's beautiful symbolism in these glimpses of Messiah. We go through a process in studying the Torah called the parties. Parties is an acronym for the Peshat, the Ramez, the Drosh, and the Sod, the first letter of each word, spells orchard or garden in the Hebrew parties is like the Garden of Eden where we get deeper and deeper into the word and and the fruit that uh, comes from Torah Pesha is just the literal plain meaning which we discussed are the laws of holiness for the priest and the holy days the appointed times to come to meet the father and the holy place in the Ramez, which is just beyond the literal, we go a little bit deeper, and we see that God's character through this whole Torah portion, and Him speaking to us through His Word, which is ultimately made flesh in Yeshua, is all about Him making us holy, even as He's holy. And where the Word could not fully show us what holiness looked like embodied in human flesh, the Word became flesh and showed us total selfless love and laying down his life. And so we see hidden glimpses of Messiah. And here we're speaking about the priest. The first glimpse that we're going to see is the priest has to seek a pure bride. And we just learned that she must be from his people, his own tribe. Now Yeshua is from the tribe of Judah. But the greater tribes are the whole house of Israel. And so we see why Revelation speaks about the, the virgin bride and, and symbolism of the 144,000 coming from every one of these tribes. We will also see in chapter 23 a prophetic glimpse of Messiah in the purpose, the prophetic purpose of the holy days. Everyone is pointing to both his comings, first coming and second coming. And then in the last chapter we will see symbolism of Yeshua in the holy place furnishings. Even the menorah represents him and the table of showbread and the altar of incense. And so ultimately we don't just take this head knowledge and say, oh, now I understand these things. It's all about our application. How do we apply it to our own lives? He's our example. He's shown us how to be holy. He lived a life of self-denial, fasting and praying, complete connection with the Father. Everything that he had done was because of his connection to the Father. And you have that same connection. You have that same access to the Father. This is why he said, even greater things you will do. Because where he was one, in one body, we are many. And we can do these great works around the whole world. And so in this context, he was saying, even greater things you will do through the Ruach. 
So when we get into chapter 23, then we will dissect this symbolism, showing Yeshua in each one of the holy days. But I just wanted to show you kind of what the different sections of going from the literal Peshat to the Ramez, and then the Drosh going deeper into the anomalies of the word. Everything reveals Yeshua. And this is what he would have brought out as he walked along that road to Emmaus, and the disciples, after his death, didn't even recognize him. And he says, what are you speaking of? And he said, have you not heard about this, the prophesied one, the prophet of God? He came and he died and he began to expound the scriptures, the Torah, everything it says pertaining to himself. This means the way that we should read Torah is to look for these hidden glimpses of Yeshua. Everywhere it's pointing forward to him. And what a beautiful description of our high priest, the bridegroom, and how he must marry a virgin. And she must be grafted into Israel so that we can be a set-apart bride. We see in verse 16, Adonai said to Moshe, Tell Aharon, none of your descendants who has a defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. No one with a defect may approach. No one blind, lame, with mutilated face or body, a broken foot or broken armed or hunched back, stunted growth, a cataract in his eye, or festering, running sores. No one descended from Aaron, the Kohen, who has such a defect may approach to present the offerings for Adonai made by fire. He has a defect and is not to approach to offer the bread of his God. He may eat the bread of his God, both the especially holy, the most holy, and the holy, only he's not to go in the curtain or approach the altar because he has this defect, so that he will not profane my holy place. Because holiness makes us perfect. Everything's pointing to what he's doing is he's not judging negatively somebody who has a defect, but what he's saying is in perfect holiness you will be completely restored. So nothing that is a cause of sin, like a defect, is to be in close proximity with that which is eternal. And this is what he's representing here. He says, I am Adonai who makes them holy. So Moshe said these things to Aaron and his sons and to all the people of Israel. Now, the sons of Israel, as this Torah portion began saying, speak to the Kohanim, the priest, to the sons of Aaron. The sons of, Israel, of Aaron were to be the priest. They were from the tribe of Levi. Not every Levite was a priest, though. Every priest was a Levite, but not every Levite was a priest. This is because Levi had three sons, Gershon, Kohat, and Merari. And only Kohat had a son named Amram, who was the father of Moses and Aaron. So you can see why not every Levite was a priest, only those who were sons of Aaron. This is a picture from my whiteboard uh, two years ago. And I kind of diagrammed this for you. So I thought rather than rewriting it on the board, I'll just show you from two years ago that Jacob had 12 sons, and one of those sons was Levi. Levi had three sons, Gershon, Kohat, and Merari. Many people don't know why Amram and his sons were chosen over the other two brothers. But when I brought out the meanings of the names, whenever you have a question as to something significant in the Word of God, go back to the Hebrew. The Hebrew explains so much. There's symbolism everywhere. Gershon means exile or foreigner. And so the foreigner has the ability to be grafted into Israel, but the foreigner cannot, apart from Israel, be a kingdom of priests. So Gershon's name is not indicative of one who would be able to fulfill God's original covenant of the whole assembly being um, a kingdom of priests. Merari means bitter. And we know the very first ordinance on the priest was to be anointed with the cure for any bitterness, any negativity, any Loshon Hara. It was the uh, oil and blood on the right earlobe, the right thumb, and the right big toe, which is actually the cure for leprosy or Zara'at, which is caused by uh, speaking or thinking negative against your fellow brethren. As an assembly of God, we need to be fully united. And the priest could not have any division in his mindset. So Merari could not be a good uh, name for the, the priest. Kohat actually has this word, the root of his name means assembly. 
Kohal is the Hebrew name for uh, the assembly. Like we would be a Kohal, the assembly of called out believers. And God brought a great assembly from Egypt and a mixed multitude, Egyptians and um, those from um, what was the tribe of his father-in-law? The uh, Midian. Yeah, the Midianites were grafted in. Thank you. For some reason, I all of a sudden went blank. Um, there was this ability to be grafted in to the greater assembly. Well, Kohat has got the same root of Kohal, meaning assembly. And then Amram, Am is people, Ram is exalted, just like Avraham or Avram. So this assembly of exalted people is what the Hebrew lineage is actually signifying. And then Amran has a Haron. And so we can see the priestly lineage coming from Levi to Kohat to Amran to Aaron, and only the sons of Aaron, which were Nadav, Avihu, Eliezer, and Hamar, could be priest and their offspring. Of course, Nadav and Avihu did something that God didn't ask them to do in his presence. And so they were harboring darkness and came into that light and were killed. So that only leaves Eliezer and Hamar. Eliezer ended up becoming the high priest after Aaron died. So you can kind of see today, those that we call Cohen with the last name Cohen or Levite or any of these, um, most likely Cohen would have to be a descendant of Eliezer or Hamar. So that just kind of gives you a little overview of who the priests are. But that wasn't God's original design. He had intended for all of Israel, all of them, the firstborn, to be a kingdom of priests, each one of us. And this is what Yeshua is restoring in all of us. Exodus 19, 6 says, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall immor unto the children of Israel. Then the prophets, we know that Isaiah says, unless they speak according to the Torah and the testimony, there's no light in them. So we always love to have a double witness in something from the prophets that confirms what was written in the Torah. Isaiah 61, 6 says, but you shall be named the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God, and you will eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you will boast. It's not the wrong kind of boasting. It's not anything self-focused or self-exalting. What this is referring to is in the millennial kingdom when we can see that because of us dispersed amongst all the nations as a kingdom of priests, we've brought in Gentiles into the fullness of not only the gospel, but into being able to be in the kingdom and to live for eternity and to learn Torah from the source. So in their glory, we will boast. We will boast that because God dispersed us amongst all the nations, the the world ended up becoming saved. And this is exactly what Paul says in Corinthians. He says, God was reconciling even his enemies, the whole world, to himself through Yeshua HaMashiach. And this is why Yeshua says, I come for the lost house of Israel. They're the ones out amongst the Gentiles. They must remember who they are, return to Torah, so that they can be a light to the nations. This is the true gospel. So we'll go through chapter 22, and then we will look at the holy days. Adonai said to Moshe, Tell Aaron and his sons to separate themselves from the holy things of the people of Israel, which they set apart as holy for me, so that they will not profane my holy name. I am yod heh vav -Heh. So when we profane, when we take something holy and we make it common, Look at how it's associating it with not only profaning God, but profaning His holy name. Now, we've only been taught that if you say His name in a cuss word, or if you make, take an oath and you don't keep that oath, this is profaning His name. But He's basically saying, if you take something holy, which is set apart for me, and you profane it by making it common, you're profaning my name. What does that say about Shabbat? As we're leading up to Leviticus 23, and the very first... Holy Day is the weekly Shabbat. This has been set apart from the foundation of the world, from creation, for only holy use. And when we say, that's nice, God, but I need to work, or I need to buy and sell, or I need to do my own thing, me, 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 we're not only profaning the Sabbath, we're profaning Him and His holy name. So this has huge implications as we are seeking to be called out of the world and the false system and return to the mindset of being a holy people, a royal priesthood. We need to really take to heart these serious things that he's saying. Anything 
that has been set apart as holy for the Lord, we have to maintain as holy. And this is why God moved from the fourth commandment saying just to remember the Sabbath and not to work in it, to later, by the time that Israel entered the land, he had added an additional uh, word which went from zahor, which means to remember. Shamor means to guard and protect it. This is to keep it holy, to do whatever you can, like you would take care of your wife or you would tend to a garden, take care of Shabbat. This is why we prepare for Shabbat a day in advance and so that we don't have to do anything that would profane the day or the Lord. He says, tell them, any descendant of yours throughout all your generations who approaches the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate to Adonai and is unclean will be cut off from before me. I am Adonai. And this is why Babylon fell. Because remember Belshazzar, who was son of, or grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, brought out these holy things that Nebuchadnezzar had remained, even though he had captured many things from Jerusalem, he had kept them in a special room so they would continue to be set apart, not used and intermixed with the pagan culture. And Belshazzar brought them out for his party, basically saying that I'm equal with God, I can use these holy things. And it was that night that that hand wrote on the wall, many, many tekel you far sin. You have been weighed and found wanting. Your days have been numbered. And that very night, Cyrus, the anointed one, came and dammed up the Euphrates River and captured Babylon. And in so doing, set the Jewish people free and returned them to Jerusalem years later to restore the temple. And so you can see how God works. But what was the very night that this occurred on? The night that he was using these holy things and profaning them. Verse 4 says, any descendant of Aaron with Zara'at, this is that disease that's caused by Lashon Hara, negative speaking, or a discharge is not to eat the holy things until he is clean. Anyone who has touched a person made unclean by a dead body, or who has had a seminal emission, or who has touched a reptile or insect that can make him unclean, or a man who is unclean for any reason and who can transmit to him his uncleanliness, the person who touches any of these things will be unclean until evening and is not to eat the holy things unless he bathes in water. So if for some reason you become unclean by touching something dead or um, being associated with someone that's unclean or sick, we realize that we're unclean until sundown. And then we bathe our body, and then we're made clean again. And this is the process of God always returning us back to that purified state. After sunset he will be clean, and afterwards he may eat the holy things because they are his food, but he is not to eat anything that dies naturally or is torn to death by wild animals and thereby makes himself unclean. I am Adonai. So even blood uh, makes one unclean, ceremonial unclean, and this is why even a woman would go through a mikvah once a month after her period of uh, nidah, it's called in the Hebrew, and then she's made clean again. And man, whenever he would kill an animal or make a sacrifice, he would go through this process of cleansing. And you even see the laver outside of the tabernacle because they were making sacrifices before they would go into the holy place. Even the priest had to wash that blood off of their hands. After Oh, verse 9 says, The priest must observe this charge of mine. Otherwise, if they profane it, they will bear the consequences of their sin for doing so and die in it. I am Adonai who makes them holy. No one who is not a priest may eat anything holy, nor may a tenant or employee of a Kohen eat anything holy. Now what's interesting is David, who is from the tribe of Judah, is a type of future Messiah who will reign as high priest and king. And there was certain intermarriage between Judah and Levi early on, even though the Torah says for you to marry within your tribe. So you see when David came from um, the battlefield and he was famished and he came in, the priest gave him the old, yeah, unleavened showbread, and David ate it, and he was there in the holy place, which is a type of future Messiah who will be in the holy place as both high priest and king. And this is why Yeshua said to reign on the throne of David. 
if a Kohen acquires a slave, either through purchase or through his being born in his household, he may share his food. If the daughter of a priest, or Kohen, is married to a man who is not a Kohen, she is not to have a share of the food set aside from the holy things. But if the daughter of a Kohen is a widow or a divorcee and has no child, and she's sent back to her father's house, being under his covering as when she was young, she may share in her father's priestly food. But no one, not a Kohen, is to share in it. If a person eats food by mistake, he must add one-fifth to it and give the holy food to the priest. They are not to profane the holy things of the people of Israel, for they have been set apart for Adonai, and thus cause them to bear guilt, requiring a guilt offering by eating their holy things. Because I am Adonai who makes them holy. You see how many times he keeps reminding the people, I am Adonai, I am holy, I'm the one who makes you holy. Be holy even as I am holy. Throughout these passages you see him reminding us over and over and over again. Verse 17 says, Adonai said to Moshe, Imor, speak to Aaron and his sons and to the entire people of Israel and tell them, when anyone, whether a member of the house of Israel or a foreigner living in Israel, brings his offering, either in connection with a vow or as a voluntary offering, and brings it to Adonai as a burnt offering, in order for you to be accepted, you must bring a male without defect from the cattle, the sheep, or the goats. You are not to bring anything with a defect because it will not be accepted from you. Whoever brings a sacrifice of peace offerings to Adonai in fulfillment of a vow or as a voluntary offering, whether it comes from the herd or from the flock, it must be unblemished and without defect in order for it to be accepted. This is the original sin of Cain. That self that was ever so subtle in his life, even though there had never been death up to that point, and only Adam and Eve had sinned but repented, when he was making an offering to the Lord, he withheld the best of his flock. Remember, he was a shepherd of the flocks, where Abel, I'm sorry, Cain was uh, produced the fruit of the land, and Abel was a shepherd of the flocks. And whether you're producing food and fruit, like we do at Sukkot, we bring an ingathering of harvest before the Lord as an offering, or whether you're bringing an animal, it's to be the best, without blemish. And Cain, we're told from the Dead Sea Scrolls, brought substandard. He saved the best for himself and gave the substandard produce to the Lord. This is why his sacrifice was not accepted. It wasn't because it was fruit versus uh, animal. It was because of the self involved in holding back the best for ourselves. Verse 22 says, If it is blind, injured, mutilated, or has abnormal growth, or has festering or running sores, you're not to offer it to Adonai or make such an offering by fire on the altar to Adonai. If a bull or a lamb has a limb which is too long or too short, you may offer it as a voluntary offering, but for a vow it will not be accepted. An animal with a bruised, crushed, torn, or cut genitals you are not to offer to Adonai. You are not to do these things in your land, and you're not to receive any of these things from a foreigner for you to offer as bread for your God, because their deformity is a defect in them. They will not be accepted from you. Adonai said to Moshe, When a bull, sheep, or goat is born, it is to stay with its mother for seven days. But from the eighth day on, it may be accepted for an offering made by fire. However, no animal is to be slaughtered together with its young on the same day, neither a cow nor a sheep or a ewe. This is because of the compassion of life. The mother is the life giver. And all of us come from a mother. So in these sacrifices, you know that every single one of these, you know, a lot of them are a year old or younger. They've come from a mother, but you don't sacrifice a mother with the young. You want to perpetuate life. If you were to bring mother and young together, not only would it be an abomination, but it would end that whole species. And this is the premise for why God says, do not cook a kid, a young goat, in its mother's milk. It's the compassion that milk is used for the sustenance and growth of the child. It's not the fact that meat and cheese can't be eaten together, because we know even Abraham brought meat and curds before the Lord, and they were eaten and accepted. So we have to understand all of these Torah commandments in their proper context. He says in verse 31, You are to keep my mitzvot, 
and obey them. You are not to profane my holy name. So once again, even keeping his mitzvot, which are holy, and obeying them is likened unto honoring God's holy name. He says, I am to be regarded as holy among the people of Israel. I am yod heh vav -He, who makes you holy, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Adonai. Now this is the lead up, the great context in which he gives the holy days, these meeting times, the Moedims, for him to meet with us because speaking is all about relationship. First you speak to create something. Then you want to instruct that something, right? As children, of course, we procreate, but God speaks things into existence, and then he instructs his children. And then when his children go wayward, he corrects them, and he tells us what instruction brings us into closer proximity with his selfless love so that we can grow into deeper relationship with him. So all of this theme about him speaking to us and making us holy is all leading up to this beautiful thing of sharing now these divine date times. I call them divine dates because if you are really preparing yourself as a bride without spot or blemish for the bridegroom and your bridegroom, your betrothed says, hey, I want to meet with you. Every week I want to meet with you and seven times a year I want to meet with you. This is going to be the only time that I can come on a long trip and we can build relationship before the wedding. And we say, that's nice, but I think I'll come a day late. Or maybe I'll come a day early. Or maybe I'll come, as some people say, well, every day is holy. They say this to justify not keeping Shabbat, right? Well, every day is holy to the Lord. No, not every day is holy. Every day is common and it's for work. The seventh day is holy to the Lord thy God. In it you shall not do any work, the fourth commandment says. You or your son or your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, your ox, your cattle, even the stranger within thy gate. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. But on the seventh day he rested and he blessed it and he sanctified it. He did three things. We always, when we open up Shabbat, have the kids say, Shekinah, what three things did God do on the first Shabbat? Amen. <laughs> it's great. Do you want to share what the holy days of the Lord are? No? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Say it real loud. You want to come up here so everybody can hear you? Every Shabbat, we remind the children what the purpose of Shabbat is, and that Shabbat's not the only holy day, but that there's other holy days. And so, we will see. Here, you can stand in front, so that you can, because you might not be able to see. Okay, go ahead. The holy days um, are the weekly one is Shabbat, and then... Where are they found? Leviticus 23. Very good. The, the weekly one is Shabbat, and then there's Passover, then there's Matzah, which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, and there's Shavuot. Mm-hmm, 50 days uh, later. Yom and then in the fall is Yom Teruah, right? And Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, and then... Um, and then Sukkot is seven-day feast. It's the feast of the gathering of the fall harvest. And after the seven days, the eighth day is called what? Shemini Atzeret. Very good, which means the eighth day assembly. And what's the other name for Shemini Atzeret? We rejoice in the Torah because Torah is completed. The whole Torah cycle is completed on that day. It's called Simcha Torah. So it has two different names. Very good, Shekinah. Well done. It's so wonderful to constantly bring these things to mind, not only for our young children, but for all of us because like our forefathers, it doesn't take but one generation. If you assimilate and you let go of Shabbat and you observe other religious practices, these things will be forgotten in one generation. And so it's so important to reintroduce them as God is waking us back up to return. So in Leviticus 23, we are going to see these holy days, and we're going to talk about the symbolism. In the past, you can find videos where I've shared on how to observe them, what the moon is doing, what the sun's doing, what the agriculture is doing. But today, I think we will focus on more of how they prophetically point to Yeshua and why our brother Judah does not recognize Yeshua as the Messiah yet. He will, but this has a big part of why he's not recognized yet. The very first one, Leviticus 23, Adonai says to Moshe, Tell the people of Israel the designated times of Adonai. This is these divine dates which you are to proclaim as his holy convocations are my designated times. So these are not the feast of the Jews, as the world calls them. He says these are my designated times. 
and these are holy. And remember what he said, if you profane something that's holy, you're profaning my holy name. So it's very important for us as the descendants of Israel to observe these appointed times that are his. And he starts off in verse 3, Work is to be done on six days, but the seventh day is a Shabbat of complete rest, a holy convocation. You are not to do any kind of work. It is a Shabbat for Adonai, even in your homes. So he starts off. And then he, we know that this is commemorated in the fourth commandment. It goes all the way back to creation. Before there was ever Israel, before there was ever a Jew, this was for all mankind. God set apart the seventh day for rest. Why? Because children of God are princes and princesses. They're free. They're not slaves. A slave works seven days a week. But free men, they rest, especially on their father's holy days. Exodus 31, 13 tells us that this is the sign. A sign in Hebrew is ot. It's like a mark. Hasatan has a sign, a mark, a counterfeit in these days that are not Shabbat. Islam worships on Friday, Roman Catholicism and most of the Protestant world on the day of the sun, the first day of the week. But the seventh day is the sign between God and his people and it's like the diamond on the ring of the betrothal. He says, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths for this is a oat, a sign between me and you. How long? Just for a couple of years? Forever. Throughout all your generations, forever, amen. We know it from Isaiah 66, it is forever, because he says, when there's a new heaven and a new earth, all flesh will come before me on the new moons and the Sabbaths. So if he orchestrated this from the foundation of the world, and it's going to be in the renewed world, why would he ever do away with it in between? He hasn't. He says that the very purpose of this throughout all of our generations is so that you will know that I am yod Hey vav Hey, who sanctifies you. This is exactly what we're talking about today. Through the observance of these holy days, we will remember and our children will remember that it's Him who makes us holy by observing these holy things. Now we realize it's not burdensome. It's not rules and restrictions. These are laws of love and how to love Him and how to be made holy and how to draw near to Him. Because light cannot coexist with darkness. And through sin, which is the transgression of the Torah, we have been separated from Him. Isaiah 59, 2 says that as well. So it's through re-embracing these that we can draw near to Him. And this is what a loving Father desires. All of His instructions are laws of love and how to draw near to Him so that we will be children of light once again. Isaiah 56, 6 and 7 says, Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, I will bring to my holy mountain. Now this goes greater than just Israel. He's saying everyone who keeps from defiling Sabbath, these are those who are grafted into Israel, who are observing Shabbat, who can't even trace their lineage. What is he saying? They're going to be in the millennial kingdom. That's what it means that he's going to bring them to his holy mountain. Then he goes into the annual holy days. So the seventh day is every week that we observe this. This is a divine day. But then there's seven times throughout the year. And what's interesting is if you count Shabbat as the first one in Leviticus 23, and then you look at, we will say the seventh day, is number one, okay? Then you would say Pesach is number two second one that's introduced. And Hag Matzo, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, is the third holy day that's instructed. Now we have this festival that's called Bikarim. It's the first fruits, but it's not a separate holy day. And sometimes it falls within the week, most of the time it does, falls within the week of unleavened bread. So it's not a separate uh, holy day. So that's why we don't count that as a separate holy day. Only when Passover is at the end of the week, like it was in the year that Yeshua uh, was crucified. When he was crucified on Wednesday, he was in the grave Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Three full days and three full nights. Leviticus is going to tell us, which we're going to read very soon, that you start counting the 50 days of the Omer from the day after the Shabbat, after Pesach. Well, since that Shabbat was three days later, Bikarim ended up being the first fruits that Sunday, and that's when he rose from the grave, and we're going to see the symbolism of that. Then Shavuot would be the fourth holy day mentioned, and we're going to talk about the symbolism of each of these as we go through them. Yom Teruah would then be the fifth. Yom Kippur would be the sixth. 
Now look at how beautiful this is because Sukkot is a seven day feast and it represents the seventh millennium, the millennial kingdom. This is what Shavuot represents and this is why Zechariah 14 says that all nations will come up to Jerusalem on the Feast of Sukkot during the millennium because it represents the millennium. It's the feast that Yeshua was born in. He was born on the first day of it. And it's the time that he, the millennium will begin again. So here Sukkot, which represents the seventh millennial day, is the seventh holy day. The feast. Now not all holy days are feast. Like Yom Kippur is a fast, right? So sometimes people use these misnomers and they'll say the feast of the Lord. They're not all feasts of the Lord. They're holy days of the Lord. Some days we feast, some days we fast. And then the eighth day, what's beautiful, Simchat Torah is actually called the eighth day assembly. It ends up being the eighth one, representing after the millennium, after sin and death are destroyed, the new heavens and the new earth begins, the eighth millennium begins eternity. And this is where we are made at one with God without sin, and we can forever be in His presence, and His new Jerusalem descends. So now as we go through Revela I mean, uh, Leviticus 23, you can see the seven and eight holy days that we are discussing, and we'll look at the symbolism of them Verse 5, in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, between sundown and complete darkness. Now, when is sundown? Is it at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day? At the beginning. So, this was, yeah, the evening and the morning were the first day. So, this is telling us that this is at the beginning of, after the 13th day, the 14th day is the beginning. This would be the first day of unleavened bread. This is why in the New Testament, sometimes they refer to Passover as the first day of unleavened bread, and people say, why? It's actually because they're following Torah to a T. On the 15th day of the same month is the festival of matzah. Seven days you're to eat matzah. On the first day you are to have a holy convocation. Don't do any kind of work on this day. Bring an offering made by fire to Adonai for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy day. Do not do any ordinary work. So the first day and the seventh day of this week-long matzah, starting with Pesach and ending uh, on the seventh day, is a week-long feast, but only the first day and the seventh day are holy days that you don't do any work on them. Now, what are they pointing to? On the 10th of Nisan, Israel would bring the lamb into the home. On the 10th of Nisan, Yeshua entered into Jerusalem, and the lamb would be inspected for four days and then sacrificed on the 14th day. And Yeshua was inspected for four, four days and sacrificed exactly when the lambs were being sacrificed in Jerusalem on the 14th day of Pesach. What's interesting is that all of these holy days have origins that go much before they started being observed or introduced in the wilderness. Pesach, for instance, refers to the lamb who was slain from when? The, the foundation of the world. Amen. And so we see that it represents not only his sacrifice, but as our example, the need for us to die to self. No one is going to willingly lay down their life as long as they're holding on to some aspect of self, right? And self-preservation or self-exaltation or self-gratification. So his example literally symbolizes our need to die to self. Yeshua is the Passover lamb. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8 says, For indeed, Messiah, our Pesach, has been sacrificed in our place. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the yeast of malice and wickedness. This is that division, the bitterness of people dividing themselves from one from another. The apostles understood this, and this is why 50 days later, what, what is the purpose of the 50 days as we're counting the Omer? To be in complete unity, one accord. It says they were in one accord in Jerusalem. If they were not unified, and if they were not at the place where he placed his name, the Spirit of God would not have poured out upon them. It says that we are to observe this feast with the matzah, the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. It's beautiful. Hag matzah is what we call it in the Hebrew. And we are reminded of Yeshua, how he was beaten and, and stripped and pierced, much like the matzah is stripped and beaten and 
Isaiah 53 refers to this fulfillment in the suffering servant. You know, his first coming, he didn't come as a Messiah. Messiah means Mashiach, which is anointed as king. They never saw him anointed as king, so how can they call him Messiah? It would be against Torah. But they did see him beaten and sacrificed. And in this way, he fulfills Isaiah 53 and the prophet like unto Moshe of Deuteronomy 18. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes, we are healed. You see the little piercings and the stripes, much like Yeshua was. This amazing symbolism that te teaches us that we need to not only die to self, but we need to live a sinless, holy life. This is what unleavened bread represents. And then ultimately, this gives us new life so that death cannot have any hold in us. This is what leads to those who will be resurrected. And he's the first fruits of the resurrection, the Bikarim. And so we see the priest would come. This is the Feast of Barley. Down here I've got the, the uh, produce or the agriculture that's happening. During Shavuot it's wheat. And in the fall it's grapes, figs, olives, pomegranates, and etrogs. And here the barley would be taken as a sheave and lifted up from the field and waved, cut off from the field, just like Yeshua was cut off from the land of the living, but then lifted up and presented before the Father is symbolizing Him. Because what did He say? He told Mary, when Mary saw Him right after He rose from the dead, do not hold on to me or touch me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. He's going to be presented as a first fruits of the grave. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. This also tells us how Yeshua looked at himself in relationship to the Father. He's always recognizing and giving homage to that Father is God. He's not saying, I'm God, right? He is the Son of God. And we have to understand His rightful place. This is one of the big contentions and reasons why Jews will never be converted to understand the beauty of Yeshua fulfilling all of these mitzvot because we're using wrong terms for Him. We're saying putting Him in the place of God or a secondary God and we're calling Him Messiah when He has not yet fulfilled the requirements of Messiah. Messiah is prophesied He will rebuild the temple and return the exiles of Israel and he will usher in a messianic age where there's total peace and freedom from all other nations and reign as king. This has not happened yet. So sometimes we're using terms that are not appropriate, which is causing other people to say, nope, that doesn't fit with scripture, so this is why I won't recognize him. But if we would simply put him in his rightful place, say, you know, in his first coming, look at how he's fulfilled. The spring feast all point to exactly what he fulfilled. He's the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, and he's the prophet like unto Moshe, who is meek and humble in Deuteronomy 18. He has fulfilled these. And the fall, then, will point to his second coming, where he will be recognized as a bridegroom, as a priest, and as a king, Mashiach, and he will be anointed. But what's happening in between is this Shavuot, which is in between the spring and the fall. And it's very interesting that we count 50 days, seven complete Sabbaths, seven complete weeks. And if... Pesach and Matzah and Bikarim represent our death to self, the false identity, and a newness of life and holiness. Shavuot represents entering into covenant through the Holy Spirit of truth because it is a day that God always makes covenant or renews covenant with man. And what is happening in the heavenly sphere with Yeshua is he's reigning as a high priest already. So this title of high priest is already happening simultaneously as he's interceding in the heavenly throne, helping us enter into covenant. The only way we can enter into covenant is to return to the covenant and the covenant book, which is Torah. So if Torah has been done away with, all of this gets lost and people don't understand the beauty of this. He says, I'm going to send one, the comforter, more powerful, the Holy Spirit. We know that the Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth, right? And in John 17, 17, Yeshua says, Father, sanctify them, speaking of all of His people, in Thy truth. Thy word is truth. So we have to return to the word to understand the truth, to be sanctified, which means to be set apart. There is no holiness when you do away with the word of God. So Shavuot is a beautiful symbol 
that reveals not only Yeshua as the high priest in heaven, Hebrews 9.11 says, but Messiah has become a high priest of good things to come. See, there's still so much more to come. The fulfillment of all the rest of the prophecies in the fall feast. By a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. Do you know Shavuot, just like Passover, began much before. It didn't begin in the wilderness. Shavuot was actually observed by Noah when Noah came out of the ark after a year of the flood and he built an altar to the Lord. God renewed his covenant with mankind and he says I will not no longer let the earth be destroyed by water and he sent a rainbow to confirm that covenant to ratify that covenant. That was on Shavuot that that happened that the rainbow given. Isaac, Yitzhak, Abraham's son, son of the covenant which God had promised Abraham was born on Shavuot. The Ten Commandments and all of Torah was given to our forefathers on Shavuot. God made covenant. This was the time of the betrothal with the future bride. So many people, another misnomer, say that God married Israel on this date. No, he just betrothed her. The wedding comes on Yom Teruah much later. This is the betrothal. The bride has to remain in waiting without spot or blemish until the bridegroom comes back. The bridegroom will always go and prepare a place off of the father's house called a hoopah for the wedding. And during that time she needs to be watching and waiting and keeping herself pure and then he comes back on a day that she doesn't expect, usually on a dark day so that he can surprise her with his whole entourage and herald which is a new moon. This is the only holy day that falls on a new moon. And he comes and gets outside of her house to surprise her, usually after midnight, and blows a trumpet, and then the heralder proclaims, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Well, this is exactly what's being described from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from Joel to Paul, about the second coming on Yom Teruah on this exact date. This is what it's foreshadowing. But some of the significant things that happen on Shavuot is that the Spirit of God will always descend when the people are unified. Noah and his wife and his three sons were unified after coming out of the ark. Israel was unified at the base of Mount Sinai. The apostles were unified in Jerusalem. The Spirit of God comes down as a flame of fire to the point where it's even scorched the mount, uh, now it's called Jabal el Laz, but uh, Sinai over there in Saudi Arabia has scorched granite at the top so much that it's melted the granite and turned it to glass. To this day it's blackened glass. Um, you can see the, the glory of the rainbow, the glory of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. That's one indicator. The other thing is that languages are understood. And everyone could understand what God was saying, but it scared them. So they said, God, no longer speak to us. Speak to Moses, and whatever he tells us, we will do. And this is how we got the written Torah. Otherwise, if we, our forefathers, had not been afraid of God's voice, he intended to speak to us intimately. And that's what today's message is all about, speaking, how he wants to speak to us. A relationship is only built on communication. And a bridegroom and a and a bride love the sound of each other's voice. So we shouldn't be afraid of God's voice. But we see this even symbolized, the flame of fire and the voices, in that on Pentecost, on that very day, it said that the Spirit of God descended like flames of fire upon their head, and everyone heard the message of Yeshua and how he had fulfilled prophecy in their own tongue. The true fulfillment of the gift of tongues is understanding these languages. So, beautiful how we see symbolism of it in Noah, Yitzhak, Israel, the disciples. And we have to remember that on this day that we're counting up to, which is one week and one day from today, we want to be unified so that God can descend his spirit upon us and empower us all the more to give this beautiful message to the world. Now we come to the fall, Yom Teruah, the day that Messiah will receive his bride on a day of trumpeting. Paul says the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, 1 Thessalonians 4.16. He's quoting Joel. Joel also talks about it as a day of trumpeting. And there's probably eight to ten different scriptures that talk about this day hidden in prophecy throughout the Old Testament prophets referring to the day of trumpeting being the day of the Lord. 
So this is how we see, just like he fulfilled the spring feast point by point in his first coming, now we're going to start to see what is yet to come and how he's going to fulfill the fall feast. Yom Kippur comes 10 days later. What's interesting is that Yom Teruah, new moon feasts, are usually uh, observed over two days. You set two days aside because you don't see the moon and you're not sure which one of the dark days is the actual first day of the month. So if you took the first two days out of Tishri, and then Yom Kippur begins on the eve of the 9th of Tishri, which begins the 10th day of Tishri, you have seven complete days in between there. And what's amazing is that in the 12 steps of a Jewish wedding, they have preserved this symbolism in that a bride remains in the chuppah for seven days. So there'll be seven days between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur that the bride, he's caught up his bride on Yom Teruah, and he takes her, according to Isaiah 26, into his chamber for a little while during the indignation, because the indignation is the seventh plague, the fall of Babylon on the earth. And so he's actually hiding his bride in the heavenly chuppah for seven days, and then coming out on Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur means, Kippur comes from the root word to cover in Hebrew. So it's like a veil that's covering us, and that gets lifted on Yom Kippur. The bride comes out of the chuppah, and she knows him even as she is known. And then there's multiple things that happen on Yom Kippur. Usually the year of Jubilee is announced. The kings are always coronated on the year of uh, Jubilee and on Yom Kippur. And judgment. Not only are we made at one after coming out of the chuppah and seeing him, having that veil lifted, there's at one meant for us. But what's happening for the earth? Judgment. And this is what the twofold aspects of Yom Kippur are. You see the judgment represented by the goats and the sins placed on the one goat and him sent away. But atonement in that the veil can be lifted. Even the veil in the temple was a symbol of the bridal veil being lifted in the future at Messiah's coming. Then we have five days after this, you would have five days for a wedding supper. Remember how Revelation talks about the wedding supper of the Lamb? There's five days from Yom Kippur to Sukkot. What Ezekiel describes the earth after the fall of Babylon and the wicked being killed by a hundred pound hail and fire and earthquake, he says the, the flesh of kings and captains and mighty men that came up against Israel at Armageddon, which was right before Yom Teruah, are being eaten by vultures. So there's a feast for vultures on the earth at the same time that there's a feast of the marriage of the lamb in the heavenly sphere. You see this dual application. Sukkot then is the time that Zechariah 14 says that the Lord descends and his feet touch the Mount of Olives and he's called king of all the earth in that day. This is when he comes back and all of his holy ones with him. Some scriptures talk about him descending with all of his holy ones and people haven't understood it in the past. It's because the marriage has already occurred and he's now coming back with all of his holy ones. This is the whole context of this message this morning. It's how he wants us as a kingdom of priests and as a bride to be made holy so that we can be and experience that as his bride and then come back to Jerusalem on Sukkot, some future year, beginning the seventh millennial day, the Messianic age. Here's a little depiction of the millennial kingdom temple being rebuilt by Yeshua. And then it's interesting, we have down in verse 36, uh, after it describes the seven days of Sukkot, it has this separate feast. And it says, seven days you're to bring an offering made by fire to Adonai, but on the eighth day, you're to have a public assembly. This is a time that represents the purpose of the Sukkot representing the millennium is that Yeshua is writing Torah upon our hearts for a thousand years. And this is why sin can be done away with at the end of the thousand years. When the eighth day begins, which is after the thousand year millennium, we can rejoice that Jeremiah 31 is totally fulfilled, that Torah is written upon our heart. That's what the renewed covenant is of Jeremiah 31. He says, it's not like the covenant of old, which I made with your forefathers, where I gave them a written Torah. I'm going to write my Torah on their hearts, he says in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. And so this is what the eighth day assembly represents. It's a public assembly 
Galilee where we can totally rejoice that sin is done away with, Torah is written upon our heart, that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and that God himself will descend from heaven in the new Jerusalem and be able to dwell with us forever after. The earth will become then the center of all cosmic worship. Imagine however many other creations he's created. Like Job talks about the sons of God coming and presenting themselves and giving an account of their different dominions. Imagine that happening on this earth and us being able to experience that. Amazing that God would choose to live with his bride. And then it describes the new Jerusalem coming down adorned as a bride. Another wedding symbolism. Why? Because when the bride at Yom Teruah becomes one with her husband, Messiah, she's no longer a bride, right? It says the two shall become one flesh. Now Messiah is like the bridegroom awaiting the new Jerusalem. And so she's adorned as a bride and all of heaven descends with all the heavenly hosts and angels. So it's beautiful to think a thousand years apart, two different types of weddings symbolizing two different aspects of our salvation and the total restoration of all things. So this is what Leviticus 23 was pointing to, foretelling the first coming and this period of 2,000 years in between and the second coming. And just like Moses was humble and meek, God promised that there would be a prophet like unto Moshe, but Moses couldn't bring the children of Israel into the promised land, could he? It took Yehoshua. 40 years later, and there's 40 jubilees in between this time of Yeshua's first coming and second coming. It's amazing symbolism. And he comes back like Yehoshua, more like a king arrayed for battle to save us from Armageddon. And so you see Moshe representing this aspect, Yehoshua representing this aspect, and the total fulfillment of him being Mashiach, and recognized by Jew and Christian and Gentile alike. In that day, all knee will bow and everyone will recognize him because he will truly have fulfilled being Mashiach and fulfill all the scriptures. So, then verse 37, he says, These are the designated times of Adonai that you are to proclaim as holy convocations and bring an offering made by fire to Adonai, a burnt offering, a grain offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, each on its own day, besides the Sabbaths of Adonai, your gifts, all your vows, and all your voluntary offerings that you give to Adonai. But on the 15th day of the seventh month, the 15th day of the seventh month is the beginning of this Sukkot feast here. It goes from the 15th to the 21st. He says, when you have gathered all the produce of the land, what's the produce? The grapes, the figs, the olives, the pomegranates, the etrogs. So when the prophets refer to the day of the Lord and refer to him treading down the wine press of his wrath, this is because the grapes are ripe at that time. He's telling you the exact time of year, which is late September, early October every year. This is why he says, you're to bring the produce of your land and you're to observe the festival of Adonai, seven full days. The first day is to be a complete rest. And then, remember how this was the first day and the seventh day during Passover and unleavened bread? Here, the holy day is the first day and the eighth day because he wants our focus to constantly be looking forward to that eighth day. A complete rest, no work. On the first day you're to take choice fruit, palm fronds, thick branches, river willows, and celebrate in the presence of Adonai your God for seven days. So here's a, oh maybe, oh here it is. Here's the four species that we just described here. So you have the palm frond, you have, this is the myrtle here, the palm fronds, the longer one. Then you have the curly willow, or the willow by the brook. And then the etrog is held in the hand. That's the palm of a good fruit. Each one of these is symbolized for Sukkot, the millennial day, representing every different kind of person. The beautiful thing is that some plants have fragrance but don't produce fruit. Some plants have fruit but don't have a fragrance, like the date palm. The curly willow has neither fruit nor fragrance, but the myrtle is fragrant but has no fruit. The etrog is the only one that has a beautiful fragrance and it produces fruit. And what this represents is spiritually is some people have the fruits of the spirit and they're like a fragrant aroma to the Lord that's having both. 
producing good works. Other people do good works, but they have no knowledge of Torah. They don't know why they're doing it. They just think, well, this is what's to be done, right? So they might not necessarily have the fruits of the Spirit, but they produce good works. Other people, vice versa. But the etrog is the ultimate goal of the millennium, having Torah written upon our hearts so that we are a fragrant aroma to the Lord. And this represents our, our prayers as well as the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, self-control, all of these things that are made manifest when the Spirit of God truly resides in us. And so this is a beautiful symbol that the millennium begins with people of all different types that are going to be learning Torah. Not everybody's perfected at the beginning of the millennium, but by the eighth day, everyone can rejoice in the Torah, Simchat Torah. The Torah is fully written upon our heart, and then we'll all be represented by this priceless etrog. Verse 41 says, You are to observe it as a feast to Adonai seven days in the year. It is a permanent regulation, generation after generation. Keep it in the seventh month. You are to live in a sukkah for seven days. A sukkah is a temporary dwelling. Why? Because the millennium is just a temporary period compared to eternity. And it's not going to last forever because there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. So when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they dwelt in booths also, temporary dwellings. This reminds us not only of the past, but it also reminds us of the future and the millennium, and but ultimately looking forward to eternity. So that generation after generation, you will know that I am the one who made the people of Israel live in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Adonai, your God. Thus Moshe announced to the people of Israel the designated times of Adonai. It's so beautiful. Now the focus of him speaking to us moves from us being holy priest and knowing how to observe his holy days and what they were pointing forward to, to now looking forward to being able to officiate in his holy place and what the symbolism of the holy place represents is our sanctified walk the process of being made holy which has a need for after the cleansing in the outer court you come into the holy place and you see the showbread which represents torah and us being living torahs and you see the menorah which represents the light of god shining through us even though that we're fallen humanity just like the oil flowed through the um, used undergarments of the priest and could be a great light and the menorah always illuminated the Torah across the room from it and then right in front of the veil was the altar of incense which represents our prayers which ascend as a fragrant aroma these three aspects are all necessary not one can be missing in our process of sanctification being made holy we need to be studying the Torah and having it written upon our hearts we need to be a light to the nations that means living it out. We can't be a light unless we're living it out. That's why he says, not only hear, but do, right? That's what Shema means. And then constant communication with the Father will enable us to have the same power that Yeshua had over sin, to be overcomers. So the very first thing that's mentioned here is the process of preparing the menorah. In closing, chapter 24 here is only 23 verses. Adonai said to Moshe, order the people of Israel to bring you pure oil. This is representing the desire of God's people to obey. In a pure heart, a child, a pure child will always say, yes, daddy, trusting that what he says is right and good and for their, in their best interest. And this pure olive oil is to come from crushed olives, representing that our characters are refined and processed back to that place of a child through tribulation and trial and the crushing ordeals that we go through. So Israel is to bring pure oil from crushed olives for the light. And remember what David said? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So God's word is actually the light that shines through us. To keep lamps burning always. Not like the five virgins who let their lamp go, went out because they didn't have enough of God's word written upon their heart. Outside the curtain of the testimony, in the tent of meeting, this word meeting here is actually the tent of Moed. The holy days are called Moeds in Hebrew. He's calling the holy place the tent of Moed, his appointed time where he's meeting with us. It's beautiful. Adonai, I mean, uh, Aaron is to arrange for the light to be kept burning always, from evening to morning. Another clarification that evening becomes first and then the morning. We 
in our spiritual walk move from darkness to light. And so God has put everything in the solar system to relay this message to us that he's moving us from darkness to light. The day begins in darkness, moves to light. The week goes from common to that which is holy at the end. The month moves from the dark part of the month, that's the beginning of the month, to the lightness of the full moon. The year, the solar um, cycle, begins in the winter time. This is when the sun is seen the least, there's the least amount of light, and moves to the summer solstice, which is m the majority of light, more than darkness. So you can see everything that God has put, even in his creation, to show us that he's going to move mankind, even though he's fallen in sin, from darkness to light. And here, Aaron is to keep this light burning eternally, from evening to morning. This is to be a permanent regulation throughout all your generations. He is always to keep in order the lamps, the pure menorah, before Adonai. You know, it's one of the only pieces of furniture that is pure, solid gold, has no wood on the inside of it. Most other things, even the Ark of the Covenant, is acacia wood with overlaid gold. But being a light represents that this gold was hammered, just like the olive oil was hammered and crushed and pressed. The gold was even crushed and hammered and pressed. And it represents that God purifies us through the trials and tribulations that we go through. Sometimes we receive crushing blows. Sometimes we go through horrible beatings and tribulation. But if we will allow it, it will be for our good. If we will keep our eyes on Him and not allow bitterness or cynicalism to creep in. Yeshua says in Matthew 24, when the love of many grows cold, when iniquity shall abound in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. So we have to be careful to guard ourselves against that, to not let our love grow cold, to be like the hammered pure gold that just shines the light of His love because we're reflecting His light. We have no light of our own. And this is another symbol in the solar system of the moon, having no light of its own, but when fully facing the sun, it can fully reflect the light. All of these beautiful symbols are constantly to remind us. Verse 5 says you're to take fine flour and use it to bake 12 loaves. Before we get into that, there's a beautiful text in 2 Corinthians 4, 6 that says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory, and glory in Greek is doxa, which means character. The character of God's selfless love is what is going to be shining forth from us in the view of Yehoshua, who's the greatest revelation of that selfless love. This is what the menorah is all about. And just like he's the living Torah and we're to be living Torahs, he's the menorah as the example, but we're also to be lights and little menorahs. John 8, 12 says, Then spake Yeshua unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And in Revelation, we know that the assemblies of called out believers, Messianic believers that have the commandments of God and the testimony of Yeshua, are identified as menorahs. Remember the seven branch, branches of the menorah are in Revelation 2 through 4. John 3, 19 says, And this is the condemnation, that the light came into the world, but men loved darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. Light will always expose what's happening in the darkness. If you're selfless, you'll say, Yes, Father, I have sinned. I'm sorry. Let it be exposed. Let me be cleansed. But if you want to hold on to a sin, this is when you don't want the light to shine on it. And this is the way the majority of the world was. Now this showbread... Twelve loaves, each one was a gallon of flour. And God told Moses to have Aaron arrange them in two rows, six in each row, representing the twelve tribes of Israel. On the pure table before Adonai, he said to mix with the flour frankincense in each row to be an offering made by fire to Adonai in place of the bread as a reminder of it. Regularly, every Shabbat, he's to arrange them before Adonai. They are from the people of Israel as a covenant forever. They will belong to Aaron and his sons, and they are to eat them in a holy place, because for him they are of the offerings for Adonai made by fire especially holy. This is a permanent law. So we're going to see this reinstituted during the millennium. Imagine seeing Yeshua officiating as high priest and doing these things that are representing us in the process of sanctification for the whole house of Israel. It will be a beautiful thing to 
see through his eyes and to understand. I mean, here we're just seeing through a glass dimly, as Paul says, right? We're just starting to see the beauty of everything that it was pointing to. He's going to reveal it even more fully. So this is the reason for the reinstitution of the tabernacle and the sacrificial system and the offerings so that we won't miss one aspect of Torah as being arbitrary. Because if we misunderstand and we think God is arbitrary, then we're going to misunderstand his character. He says in verse 10, there was a man who was the son of a woman of Israel and an Egyptian father. He went out among the people of Israel, and the son of a woman of Israel had a fight in the camp with the man of Israel, in the course of which the son of the woman of Israel uttered the name of the yod heh vav -Heh in a curse. So they brought him to Moshe. His mother's name was Shlomit. Now, Shlomit means peace, much like Shlomo. Uh, Solomon's name meant peace. And she was the daughter of Dibri. The root word of Dibri is Debar, which is the word of God. The word of God will always bring peace. We teach it to our children. And so this woman should have known and instructed her son in the oracles of God so that this never occurred. But it shows the influence of the father who was an Egyptian. She was from the tribe of Dan, who were the judges of Israel. So they put this man under guard until Adonai would instruct them on what to do. And Adonai said to Moshe, tell the man who cursed outside the camp, no, no, take the man who cursed outside the camp, have everyone who heard him lay their hands on his head, have the entire community stone him. Then the people of Israel tell them, whoever curses his God will bear the consequences of his sin. See, if you, ne if you are living in a very nice environment and you have no idea what sin does, the wages of sin is death. It's not the wages of an angry God. God had to instruct them as to what sin would do so they wouldn't continue sinning. So in mercy, he's showing them the effects of sin before, because our lives are such, because of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, that sin doesn't kill us immediately. When it, if it wasn't for Yeshua, the Lamb, sin would kill us immediately. So he had to instruct to these people who had been indoctrinated and polluted from 210 years in Egypt what sin really does and what it means to be a holy people and the huge effect, cause and effect of sin leading to death. And this is why these instructions, which sometimes people misunderstand, they say, oh, that sounds like such a harsh God to command this. But this is how he's preventing the whole house of Israel from being lost. They said, everyone must be involved in this. The entire community must stone him. The foreigner, as well as the citizen, is to be put to death if he blasphemies the name of the Lord. And we know the definition, that according to Torah, what blasphemy is. Many people wonder, have I blasphemed or what is blasphemy? But Numbers chapter 15 describes what blasphemy is. Chapter 15 verse 30 says, If an individual who does something wrong intentionally, whether a citizen or a foreigner, he is blaspheming Adonai. So the true definition of blasphemy is when we know something to be wrong, and yet we choose because of the self to still do it, thinking that, oh, God doesn't have any control over me. And this is the amazing thing because as God is seeking to move us from the wrong knowledge into his knowledge, he's trying to teach us. We have such a high calling to live up to the light that he has instructed us in. If we don't live up to the light that he's given us, he cannot give us more light. Plus, if we go against what light we have, it's going to lead to death. And so this term blasphemy is very deep in its essence. We really need to be living up to the light that we're given. It's okay that our forefathers didn't have all the light. And sometimes, even in our life, you can see how far you've come in a knowledge of Torah. And the scriptures say God winks at our ignorance. That's because in the past we didn't know maybe about Shabbat or about the holy things of the Lord. But once you know, then you're called to a high responsibility and calling to really live out what he's blessed you in understanding. And so I just share that in context because so many times blasphemy is even given a wrong connotation or a wrong definition but according to Torah it's just simply doing something that you know that you should not do or if you know what is right to do and you do not do it Paul says to him who knows what to do and does not do it it is sin and first John or Romans 6 23 says the wages of sin is death 
And so it's so important for us to live up to the light that we have. In closing, verse 17 says, Anyone who strikes another person and kills him must be put to death. Anyone who strikes an animal and kills it is to make restitution, life for life. If someone injures his neighbor, what he did is to be done to him, break for break, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has caused the other people is to be rendered to him in return. This is because Israel had to learn, this is like the most basic understanding, but Yeshua took the written Torah and took it even further. And he's like, in selfless love, if somebody does wrong to you, don't command that the same be done to him. Forgive, even up to seven times 70, which is symbolic of forever, unconditionally. And so we see the written Torah meeting Israel where they were at after 210 years of e Egyptian slavery and influence, but God doesn't desire for us to remain there. Through Yeshua's first coming, he has taken the Torah and expounded upon it showing the principles of selfless love in a higher walk of spiritual um, of spirituality and in his first coming if he said you know it, the torah says you shall not commit adultery but i say to you you shall not even think about a woman wrong in your mind now he's taking it from action to even our thoughts and if he's doing that in his first coming, imagine what his second coming will be like when he's teaching us Torah on a whole nother level. Now, even beyond the thought, it has no place in us, no desire to gratify the self, self-exalt one self over another, um, to um, any form of self will be totally eradicated through writing Torah upon our heart and it'll be the pinnacle of having Torah written upon our heart and that spiritual walk that God takes us through, which many people misunderstand a lot of times because of the way it's written to Israel in ancient times, it doesn't mean that he desires for us to remain there. He was trying to shock them into realizing the seriousness of their sin and what they're doing to one another. But then ultimately, if something happens in the future and you have this understanding, you have more of a forgiving spirit, totally devoid of self, not wanting to see anyone harmed. And this is the beautiful progression of the word, which was once written, then became flesh, and now is going to dwell amongst us. Each time it gets better and better, and we get more holy by being in close proximity and learning from him. So with that, let's stand and close out this Torah portion. It is so beautiful to see all of these symbols, even Yeshua as the living bread of those 12 bread in the tabernacle everything is pointing to Yeshua as an example for us to be made holy and to walk in holiness so I encourage you in that walk and when you see a brother fail don't condemn him lovingly put your arms around him and encourage him on the spiritual journey that we're all on together Abba Father we thank you for revealing yourself to us through your Torah the beauty of how you desire for us to be made holy and to be a kingdom of priests once again in a renewed covenant with you to meet you on these beautiful divine date times throughout the week and throughout the year to be made holy on your holy days and as we set apart your holy days we become set apart as your holy people father now we can see the symbolism of each one of these beautiful instructions and how father you even desire for us to dwell with you in your holy place and how holy you are so we just pray that as we are on this walk father you would forgive us for our shortcomings that you would continue to have mercy on us and recreate us in your image father continue to reveal yourself to us through Yeshua and the beauty of his selfless love which is a total exemplification of your character so that by beholding we might become changed into your likeness we truly desire this father and we thank you for bringing us together in these last days to return your people that have been dispersed amongst the nations back to you through returning them back to your Torah we love you and we thank you for this high calling. In your holy name we pray. Amen.